Hi everyone, welcome to this M2D2 um, talk series. Today our speaker is Rafael Gomez Bombarelli. Um, he will be talking about differentiable simulation for enhanced uh, sampling of rare, of rare events. A bit about the speaker before we start. So Rafa is a Jeffrey Cheat Chief Career Development Chair in Engineering in the develop in the Department of Material Science and Engineering. He works his work aimed at the sorry his works aimed to field machine learning and atomistic simulation for designing material and their transformations. The Gomez Memorial Groups works at the intersection of molecular, crystalline, and polymer matter. They combine computational tools in optimization, inverse design, surrogate modeling, and active learning with simulation approach like quantum chemistry and molecular dynamics. Through his collaboration with MIT and other groups, they develop new practical materials such as therapeutic peptides, organic electronic for displays, electrolytes for batteries, or, or organic oxide for substitutional for sustainable uh, catalysis. Thank you so much, Rafa, for accepting our invitation to, to present your work here today and uh, looking forward to the talk. Thanks, thanks so much, Rudencio, for having me um, and for the great introduction. I, I just wanted to mention a couple of things uh, before I jump in. And the first one is that, that you know, please interrupt. Uh, these, these Zoom talks are, are uh, often too dry. So I'd rather, you know, if somebody has questions live, just, just pause and, and we can have a, a little bit of a conversation. I, I Otherwise, we'll just uh, make it to the end and, and have very little interaction. So if anybody has, has questions, please uh, do ask. Um, I see some known faces uh, around them, uh, around there. So uh, uh, hi, Andre, hi, Jacob. Um, happy, happy to see you virtually. Um, and I'm sure there's, there's more uh, dear friends there. Um, um, and then I, I think my title was, was very narrow. I wasn't sure sort of, this is something I'm very excited about and, and I want to tell the world about it. But uh, I have a little bit more context about, uh, about sort of what we've been doing the last couple of years that relates to sort of this interface between, between uh, simulations and, uh, and machine learning. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll give a wider overview of sort of some things that I, that I believe could be interesting to this audience. And, uh, and focus on the on the enhanced sampling for for a fraction of the time as well, and uh, you know we're, we're probably all on, on the same page here. But uh, over the last few years, we've sort of been trying to explore this uh, computational line that connects uh, first principle simulations, where you know we got the laws of physics that we the, that they you know they can extrapolate. Uh, they're uh, typically they light on data and 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 sort of hard on, on their ability to extrapolate. Um, but, uh, but they require us first place, knowing the physics that applies and B, being able to simulate it with the right accuracy, right? So, uh, and there is this trade-off uh, with, with pure black box learning at the other end of the spectrum where, you know, with more or probably less um, uh, uh, inductive bias and, and just a lot of data, it is possible to learn really complex relationships and, and really complex models. So we believe there is, there is a continuum among these two as, as far as the physical sciences are, are concerned. Our physical sciences, in our case, it means, it means atomistic simulations and it means a, a material science. So we typically care about problems that are atomically resolved and, and the degree of freedom that we care about is sort of where should these atoms be such that we get the performance that we want, right? And there is a spectrum of, of ways to blend these two things together for discovery. Uh, so I, I will describe some of these ideas ranging from, uh, from something that is very close to first principles, just learning a surrogate for, for a good physics simulator. There is this quantum mechanics is a great simulator, just very expensive. Uh, so interatomic potentials. And I think the last, last week's uh, M2D2 speaker talked about the machine learning potentials, if, I, if I've seen correctly. Um, so we've, we've done a little bit of work in this space. Uh, we've bumped it up with sort of some more uh, connections to machine learning through active learning and differentiable simulations uh, or, or learning is how to sample hard distributions uh, such as the Boltzmann distribution uh, and sort of making our way in infusing these two themes. And this includes, like I said, the, the enhanced sampling work. 
And, and if uh, last uh, week's uh, speaker was uh, talking about neural network potentials, maybe this doesn't need a lot of introduction, but I will remind you briefly that um, when we simulate sets of atoms, at the end of the day, we, in order to extract uh, averages through statistical thermodynamics, um, we need to simulate you know, ensembles of atoms. How many? Well, tens of thousands, maybe, maybe hundreds of thousands of atoms for periods of times um, that are long enough for, for the system to be so-called ergodic and, and whose uh, half the time average agree with the, with the ensemble average of the system. Um, in molecular dynamic simulations for proteins, if folks here are sort of on, on, on protein tasks, this typically means uh, uh, microseconds uh, or, or even milliseconds if possible, right? And the issue of research has the fastest computers in the world to do molecular dynamic simulations to, to get sort of to that millisecond uh, region. And, and the crux of the matter here is that um, we are integrating time in, in, we're doing Hamiltonian dynamics or Newtonian dynamics and integrating time in, in essentially femtosecond resolution, right? We've got this, this um, uh, uh, differential equation that governs the, the uh, uh, instantaneous behavior of these particles whose uh, integral over time gives us a statistical thermodynamics but because of the, of the nature of the rates of the system, we need to simulate one femtosecond at a time. Um, we need to track, like I said, uh, depending on the nature, we do a lot of materials work where sometimes we can, we can get away with simulating hundreds of thousands of atoms, but for many drug discovery applications, one is thinking more about the hundreds of thousands of atoms. Um, and then one needs to know the interaction potential, right? So this, this H here is the Hamiltonian, is the sum of kinetic energy, which is of the atoms, which is trivial. You just need to know their velocities and the, and the external potential they're subject to. That's really hard. That's actually a, a, a many body uh, sort of uh, question that can only be accurately answered with uh, um, full accuracy uh, quantum mechanics, and that is extremely expensive. So there is sort of this huge industry around, well, what, how do we simulate, how do we get this Hamiltonian uh, with the cheapest low uh, possible function? Because, you know, if we're gonna simulate a millisecond, we're going to end up calling our, our function a trillion times. So it turns out um, machine learning has sort of been applied to all flavors of, of this challenge. And, and this is what I'm going to be talking about. Um, you know, simulating fewer atoms, that's called coarse graining, where instead of having to track every atom, you decide that, you know, some atoms can be inferred from, from their neighbors or from some collective behavior. And, and AlphaFold does this, right? AlphaFold doesn't operate on the full protein with atomic resolution. It typically moves alpha carbons around, just the alpha carbons of every residue, and then maybe generate with a generative model the rest of the atoms. Um, can we can we skip forward in time? Is there some, some tricks that we can use? And a lot of folks have tried to connect these ideas with uh, time lag autoencoders and whatnot, and then uh, the interaction potential. How do we translate the accuracy but expensive quantum mechanics into functions that generalize to with better scaling? And, and in our case, we've done a lot of neural network potentials. I just want to flag one example that I think it's, it's sort of, it's, it's pretty recent and, and pretty exciting for us, which is using neural network potentials for the excited states of molecules, the calculating not only the energies and forces that drive the motion of atoms, when they're in the ground state, which is most of where, where a, a drug discovery happens, but also moving atoms in the excited state. What happens after to the, to the motion of atoms after a light gets absorbed by a molecule? And in particular, this, this backbone that you see here is what's called a photo switch. That's a molecule that can change from A to B, from this uh, uh, trans to this cis configuration when it absorbs light. And essentially the process, you know, if, if you're not familiar with this, it's, it's very hand wavily. If the molecule gets abs absorbs light, the geometry that used to be a local minimum is not a local minimum anymore. So it starts relaxing. And there is this region, it's called a conical intersection, where the excited state and the ground state uh, touch, they're degenerate. So around that region, the molecule can cross back to the ground state and either fall back to the original trans or fall back to the other a local minimum in cis. And based on sort of the complicated shape and dynamics around, around this, um, the molecule can end up in, in one or the other with a certain likelihood. Um, so we've uh, used a lot of data, I think 650,000 geometries. So we've, we've created a lot of data with, with a good quantum simulator. 
and then being able to fit a surrogate uh, that, that gives us uh, sort of this magical unit in, in neural network potentials, typically one kilocal per mole per Armstrong or one kilocal per mole is, is a good metric of success, if, if you recall maybe from last week. So we've managed to train one of these that generalizes to new chemistry. It definitely works better on the chemistries they've seen, but it has okay performance, you know, three, two, uh, about 1.8 for the, for the difference between the ground and the excited state, which relates to, to the hopping between them. So we're able to quantify uh, at what light and, and uh, for how long uh, and with what yield a molecule will do this uh, um, switch from trans to cis. Why does this relate at all with, with drug discovery? Well, this is something we've gotten excited recently uh, about. And it's the fact that this enables us for the first time to screen for photo switchable drugs. These will be drugs that are inactive in the transform, so they're, they're you know, just laying around, you take them, they don't do anything, but once you shine light on them, they fold into the other geometry and suddenly they become active and, and, uh, and bind to the pocket that you wanted. Um, this is something that the community has pushed by trial and error, and maybe you know, a, a deep human understanding, but not really big data um, for, for decades. And there is folks that have sort of big portfolios around discovering uh, photo switchable drugs that could do this. Uh, but the tools of, uh, of big data hadn't been applicable to that space because people weren't able to score the thing that makes a drug, a photo drug. This, this ability to switch and what color and for how long, what color light is necessary and for how long a molecule remains in the switched on state. So for the first time, we we're taking a stab at this chemical space, right? Enabled by this neural network potential simulator. And you've got here an array of 50 proteins. And for these 50 proteins, we plot the difference in docking score, which is a proxy for binding affinity between the on and the off form of the drugs. And, and the first thing we found is that, wow, this is hard business. Many of these have very different, very, very small differences, right? That between the open and the closed form, uh, many, many proteins don't really sense a big difference between uh, the binding of the cis or the binding of the trans. But there are some proteins that are pretty sensitive, right? You can see here, uh, uh, Casp3, right? Like this, this guy, EGFR, there is, there is, and actually people had tried to make EGFR uh, photo switchable drugs by hand before. So this has enabled us to sort of take a, a first stab at this uh, photo switchable drugs and photo draggable protein uh, design space. And, and uh, we just put this, this preprint out recently, sort of walking, walking through this process where we identify, well, what, is, what are the molecules with the biggest delta? We picked uh, uh, this, this protein. Um, part one, and then we try to explore, okay, well, what are molecules that exhibit the, the highest degree of difference between cis and trans? Um, and then can we make them a near infrared? Can we make them red shifted? And can we make them to stick around for long after they've been activated? So essentially you go irradiate once and they activate for, for a full day or a couple of days. Um, and in case anybody's curious, why do I insist on the, on the red shifting? Uh, and that is because the body is, is transparent to red light, to infrared light. And you've seen this, if you've ever shown a light, a, light, uh, a flashlight against your hand and, and uh, red light comes out, that's because your, your body is filtering out um, the, the blue and the other colors, but the red light makes uh, the deepest uh, into, the, into the tissue. So typically folks would want to activate these drugs with uh, the reddest possible light. Uh, which would be this metric and have them last as long as, as they can, which would be this metric. So ideally we want drugs up here for, for high performance and up here for high differential binding. So this is an example. There aren't many, uh, uh, or I think we're, we're the only folks that are pursuing this sort of uh, high throughput photodragable uh, chemical space. Um, and it's been fully enabled by, by a neural network potential, right? By a surrogate for an expensive quantum simulator. Um, and, and you know, 650,000 data points sounds, sounds like a lot, but it's more or less the cost of simulating the photo optical properties of one molecule. So for the cost of doing one molecule the old way, we've, we've paved the way to do 9,000 molecules uh, the new way. Um, so yes, I just wanted to sort of, I, I've got lots more uh, neural network potential examples in, in our portfolio, but uh, I, I want to sort of start switching over the differentiable theme, which is what, uh, what I think this, this uh, uh, it makes it's a good fit for for today. It turns out, as uh, as in many other applications, neural networks strongly overfit in in these for these tasks. 
Um, so we end up with having a uncertainty quantification via a huge part of neural network potentials. Um, especially for the custom made neural network potentials that we try to make, right? We're making one for this part, excited state of this chemical space. And we're not trying to make a general purpose universal potential that is kind of, ah, okay, for everything. We're trying to make really accurate surrogates for one region of, of chemical and phase space. Um, so um, our synthetic quantification becomes a, a, a necessity and active learning uh, becomes a necessity too, because it turns out there is no, uh, the only way to get sort of a good, uh, a good force field is by having data that represents the phase space the simulation will visit in production. But if one knows the phase space that the simulator will visit in production, then one already has the answer, right? What would you need? You, you don't need to do the simulation anymore. You already know what the right phase space is, right? Like at the end of the day, this simulation is a sampling technique. So if you already got a representative sample of that space, you're pretty much done. So we find ourselves in this sort of iterative process where, where we make our best initial guess of our potential. We try to gather more data. And, uh, and like I say in that, in that third bullet, we always have access to the Oracle. So in, in neural network potential design, and like other, you know, Bank of America cannot make fraudulent transactions on demand, right? That's why they need to sort of buy synthetic data or, or work with what they have. But it turns out we can go to a quantum simulator and call it again. You know, it's expensive, but it's, it's a lot cheaper than, than trying to use it for the, for the full molecular dynamics simulation. So we can go back thousands, tens of thousands of times. So what we need is some mechanisms to make sure that, that we're able to conduct active, active learning appropriately and, and efficiently. Uh, so the community has, like many other machine learning communities, sort of identified sort of these main avenues for um, uh, uncertainty estimation. Um, mean variance estimation doesn't really work for our data because our Oracle is, um, uh, is accurate to machine precision, right? We have no aleatoric uncertainty. Our, our ground truth is, is correct to numerical precision. And if we do the same DFT calculation again, the same quantum mechanics calculation, we'll get the same answer. Um, so that, that doesn't sort of help us too much. Monte Carlo dropout has been found to be, uh, at least for this class of applications and, and the graph neural networks that support interatomic potentials, uh, not very strong. It's, it, it really underestimates uncertainty and it's not well calibrated. And sampling is much better. We one just needs to pay the uh, the cost of having multiple neural networks uh, trained and, and, and uh, at inference time. And then over the last year, we've seen some appetite for for evidential uncertainty. So it's been used in general for other machine learning applications. It's been used for molecular property prediction, and uh, we're starting to see its application for um, uh, uh, for force field uncertainty quantification. So at the end of the day, the way uncertainty quantification gets applied and active learning gets applied in this context is by getting up some first generation interatomic potential and either running the simulation until the uncertainty shoots up. So run the simulation, monitor the uncertainty, and at some point pause and say, I'm too uncertain, stop. Gather that data point. But then do what? Retrain a neural network that was trained on 640,000 points with 640,001. That, that doesn't really work with, with sort of neural networks and the data sets that are here. So this, this pausing and retraining works for very lightweight, uh, maybe you know, kernel-based methods trained on, on 100 points. Um, so what folks typically do is continue running the simulation and aggregating points that are high uncertainty and hopefully are representative of the phase space now because I'm, now you're simulating with a simulator that's quote unquote broken. It's not giving you the right, uh, necessarily the right answer. And, and using it as a sample for, for uncertainty, right? What, what are points that it visits that are high uncertainty? Then probably do clustering and, and uh, do not do replicate uh, uh, evaluations with the, with the Oracle and uh, retrain. This strategy we've used in the past, it requires you know, maybe seven, maybe eight generations until we have good confidence that the training data and the phase space we're going to be doing inference at agree because at the end of the day that's what we need right that the training data agrees with the uh, with the space we're going to do inference at yeah Prudencio. yes um, when do you decide is a good time 
to to stop collecting new data like, because like yeah with, yep. with the broken simulator and uh, yeah that's a very good point um so there is two modes of failure for you know there's there is a very glaring failure mode which is that your simulation with the surrogate is not stable it breaks like the simulator uh, the, the, if the neural network potential is really bad then the simulation itself will will diverge and, and break and stop so that's obviously uh, you know you need to do further until it's stable um, but once uh, once the simulation is stable our stopping has typically been um either convergence of, of the loss or ideally convergence of the loss towards 1k cal per mole per Armstrong. That's what's called chemical accuracy. There is, there is more or less consensus on that at that level of accuracy. Um, for instance, the, the answer, the difference between well-respected simulators is higher than that. So if your neural network potential is a good enough surrogate for one for, for one uh, exchange correlation potential, for one flavor of, of quantum mechanics, um, to a degree that it's, it's more similar to it than, than the different flavors of uh, quantum mechanics are from one another, then that's a reasonable stopping point, right? Because now you, you're, you, know, you don't even know if that was the best possible quantum mechanics to do in the first place. So once you've agreed enough with that, that's typically a stopping point. So one kilocal per mole per Einstein. Yes, Sanjeev. Hi, yeah, I had a question. So um, in looking at some of these simulations, one thing that I have observed is that uh, the way that these uh, these simulations fail is that they often simulate stably for a very long period of time, and then sort of suddenly, you know, enter a region of phase space that is very unstable and then explode. So um, that's different from what I've seen in other you know autoregressive modeling tasks and machine learning where you have steady accumulation of error. So could you, you know, comment on, on why you think that's happening, maybe from a domain perspective, why you see a sudden increase in error rather than a gradual accumulation? Yeah, I, so I, I think the, the, so I have got two thoughts. One, I've, I've got sort of a proposed solution in my next slide. So I think we probably did a good job introducing this. And then the second is um, typically, let's see if I can draw here, but the, the way, um, um, the way uh, neural networks potentials will typically work is that they will default to the mean. Once you're far away from the training data, they will give you sort of this, this whatever the mean energy of the training data was, that, that's a, a reasonable prediction for, for new points, right? So we, we get to see that behavior. And typically the mean force and the, the mean energy is whatever the mean energy of the training data was and the mean force is zero. So we see typically a behavior where like you were saying, you know, your system starts simulating inside a basin and it behaves well. In theory, the basin should continue, the energy of the walls of the basin should continue rising, but the neural network potential, because it hasn't seen data now, infers sort of that things go back to the mean. So we see this, this uh, cliffs. So once the simulator eventually, you know, reaches this little cliff, it has accumulated a lot of potential energy, right? It's, it's higher up on, on energy, so it has a lot of potential energy. And then instead of, finding more wall and bouncing back, it finds, you know, an opening. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm over the barrier. It falls down from the barrier and this dumps a huge amount of what used to be potential energy at an unphysically uh, fast pace. Oops, uh, sorry, I clear where I shouldn't. It dumps a lot of potential energy into kinetic energy too fast. The kinetic energy becomes velocity and the atoms fly out to outer space and everything breaks. So it's a phenomenon, it's, it's, you, you see it in inference as a red event. So that's the thing, the failure is a red event. In the same sense, I'm gonna talk about red events two slides, so you know, whatever, if I have time, I will talk about red events eventually. This, this is what we do MD for, right? These are events that should happen, you know, once in a million, once in a trillion, that's what we need to, to do MD for a trillion time steps to eventually see these things happen. The problem is this is like a broken red event where it's, with, it's fake, it's just that we went past the boundary, right? Like sort of, uh, after that, there are monsters. The, the, there was sort of fog of war over there. The neural network didn't know what to do. And once it went over the hump, it automatically dumped all that potential energy to kinetic energy. So that's, that's the most common, that's what we see explode because that's, that's the typical explosion that we see. Um, what's our proposed solution? And maybe I can say into the next step and, and our differentiable theme where well, we don't want to wait around for things to break, especially because like you just said, 
you would need to run the full length simulation to find the rare events that break the simulator. So you need to end up paying n times the full simulation. So it turns out that all these uncertainty metrics are actually differentiable functions themselves, um, right? And in particular, if we're doing an ensemble averaging, uh, ensembling, uh, the, um, uh, um, sorry, one second, laser pointer here, or, or uh, uh, the variance of the forces that act on, every, on a given atom is going to be the ensemble uh, uh, variance over the, over the ensemble of models that we train. This is a, is a differentiable function, it's trivial, right? People have been doing this on adversarial uh, models for, uh, for images all along, right? So it turns out if we take this gradient, we can follow uncertainty a straight up uphill, right? So if our simulator in the way our simulator in the little basin before was, it knows it doesn't know what's out there, uh, so we can start climbing up in uncertainty, right? This, this allows us to do gradient ascent over uncertainty. And like you said, there is, there is a likelihood component, right? Because uh, some you know, states are, uh, will be visited as a function of the relative energy, but we have already gathered uh, a, a certain amount of, of data. Um, so we can, we can, over all the data we've visited in the past, we can assign likelihoods for, for these new points that we visit in, in the present. So we end up having this joint uh, um, product, right? The likelihood of a given new geometry and the uncertainty in the forces of this geometry. And we can literally do gradient ascent of this and, and displace our atom, our, our molecular geometry, pop, 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 pop. Uh, it's not a good sampling technique for this. This, uh, this doesn't preserve the ensemble, right? It's not a molecular dynamics simulation. It doesn't preserve the statistical properties of, of molecular dynamics, but it can definitely go uphill and against the current to identify high uncertainty regions. Um, so we got, I got a, an example here with a 2D well, which maybe reflects what you were saying, right? You start, which you start, you spend all the time with, from data in this basin. Uh, and you know the simulator doesn't know anything about the about the rest of the universe, so we just uh, train our, our uh, an ensemble, uh, quantify our uncertainty. We get we get some local maxima in uncertainty. We follow gradients uh, uphill towards those local maxima in, in this adversarial loss. Pop pop pop. I then send them to the oracle, and we quickly start exploring the, the presence of the second basin. So we get sort of faster learning. So here is just a 2D well. We've got lots of examples in the in the paper here by uh, what is it by by Daniel. Um, so we we do better error with fewer samples, and the samples that we visit are, are higher likelihood than imagine if we do, if we were doing a, a random search or a grid search over here. Many of our points or some of our points would land in high energy regions that weren't likely in the first place. And our simulator really, really need to be too good about them because we're never going to get up here. We definitely need a, a good enough potential, you know, that understands this, this barrier. But our, our potential is never going to visit this corner. So by having this likelihood in the, in the objective function that we maximized, uh, we kind of get a, a, a good performance of both. And then uh, uh, Rui, who was also involved in this paper, has sort of getting a little bit more systematic about com comparing ensembles versus uh, MVE versus evidential loss versus this sort of uh, great, uh, um, Gaussian mixture model of latent space uh, 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 distribution, right? So you can take the, the, um, uh, the latent space of points in your training data compared with the, with the embedding of the points you visit in the future and just take some, some distance metric or some clusters over, over latent space. So we've compared all these things for, for active learning. You can see how the correlation uh, with, uh, between the error and uh, either the negative block likelihood or, or the variance or, or the ensemble variance is okay, but it's not amazing. So I think uncertainty quantification for these are, you know, it's, it's good enough, but, but you know, it's not as good as we'd like. And the models are kind of pretty uncalibrated. You can see how the, the magnitudes are very different here. These ensembles go to, to thousands when these go to hundreds. And so we're, we're not sort of quite there in the, in the techniques and, and we will stay tuned for further developments. But in terms of, uh, of active learning, all of these are differentiable and all of these are capable of driving this uh, active learning loop that I say where we adversarially attack uncertainty 
rather than waiting for to encounter these these potholes, right? So maybe maybe we can think of them as potholes in the in the potential energy surface, right? Places where the, the neural networks are there, I don't know, uh, and give you low energies uh, and go quickly pop, 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 to finding through through gradient ascent. I also wanted to, to give a, a shout out to uh, Xian Fu, who uh, put this, this uh, preprint out where, where we collaborated, uh, asking the community to benchmark, not just test forces on, on a held out distribution, that's that's a that's how we train. That's that's the gradient that we use to to learn uh, interatomic potentials, matching the forces of the training data or matching the energies of the training data. But that's not enough because these these simulators are not used uh, as as static objects, but they visit a certain phase space, right? So they, they, in some sense, they eat their own dog food, right? The, the neural network potential will propose new points, and then you will evaluate the, the potential again on those points. And, and create this sort of self-sustaining simulation. And it turns out being good at predicting forces is not a, a, a good predictor necessarily of performance at, at these other metrics. So for instance, um, there is here a, a ForceNet. ForceNet is a neural network that is not energy conserving. So it just learns gradients. It doesn't learn gradients. Uh, it doesn't learn forces as the gradient of energy. It literally just learns forces and it, it seems it does very good on the forces. It seems like the, the, uh, it can be trained to do very good on the forces sometimes, not necessarily here, um, but it, it's horrible in, to make stable simulations because it, it doesn't learn you know, uh, energy conservation. So um, this I think has been well received by the, by the community in terms of uh, trying to quantify, sort of put a finger on, on the things that folks find, found, were finding that, that weren't working for them. Um, and then uh, on, my, on my next step, sort of maybe ramping up into more neural, more machine learning based concepts uh, and, and uh, their fusion with physics. Um, I want to talk about differentiable simulators. This is something that folks are excited throughout, right? And, and it builds on, uh, on the Duvenos paper from, uh, from 2019 and, and some follow up works. Um, uh, in our world, we only solve one differential equation, but of course, there's the only differential equation we we're solving is this Hamiltonian dynamics, right? Where the, the momentum is the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to position, and the derivative of position uh, is the, the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to momentum, right? We got our sim uh, symplectic integrators uh, that, that conserve energy. And we only, in my world, we only care about this uh, differential, uh, um, differential equation. But these concepts are, of course, applicable to many other differential equations. And, and what was proposed in this 2019 paper was that uh, one could treat sort of the, the, uh, uh, every step of a, of a differential equation as a, as a neural network uh, call. Um, and through the use of the adjoint method, back propagate through the time evolution of a simulation. And that was very compelling to us because Oftentimes we find ourselves fine, you know, saying what interatomic potential, you know, nature, I can measure something, I can measure an observable, what interatomic potential produced this observable? Um, and having been able to do this through gradient descent, finding what interatomic potential makes this behavior arise is a lot more useful than having to do some, some sort of try and error or, or Nelder mid simplex method where, where we don't have gradients. So uh, by, by just running the simulation forward, keeping track of the adjoint as an auxiliary system, um, and then running the simulation back in time to accrue the derivative of the loss without the respect the simulation parameters, we can start asking questions across the length of a molecular dynamic simulation. So for instance, this, this was uh, from, from Wuji's paper in 2020, where we, let's see if the video runs. So we asked, what is, what is the interatomic potential um, yeah, how do I integrate through the ensemble? That's a great question. That's, that's what the adjoint does. So the adjoint creates a stateful uh, mirror of the system where it keeps the track of the loss with respect to the, so the adjoint at a given time is the derivative of the loss with respect to uh, P and Q at that time, right? And then if we want to get the loss across the ensemble, so the loss um, throughout the time evolution of the simulator, um, we, uh, we just integrate the ensemble backwards. In, we just integrate the adjoint backwards in time. And in terms of having, you can have an ensemble, a loss that depends on, on an ensemble, 
right? So we just define the loss. Imagine if, if we want a, a molecular dynamic simulation whose ensemble behavior is XYZ, we just pick you know, one member every 50 steps, makes it into the loss, right? And then when we back propagate, our loss will represent the ensemble and the influence of sort of the time evolution of these parameters in the ensemble. So it's, it's a, and I have an example right here. Uh, this this forced the chain of beads fold into a helix. Um, this forced some coarse grain potential to learn the interatomic interactions that make water get the structure of water. So people can measure a so-called the radial distribution function. That's an ensemble property of, 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 of a material. That, that measures sort of the pairwise, uh, it's, a, it's an integral of the pairwise distances. The, the, how many neighbors do I have at a given distance, right? So the first peak is my first order neighbor, second peak is second order neighbors, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, like you said here, there is a, a little bit of a smearing. So we do histograms, we put some smears on them so we don't have a, a, a clipping uh, at the edges of the, of the histograms, right? At the edges of so the pin. And, and exact question that uh, Hao Tsang asked, uh, a bunch of points in the, in the simulation become part of the loss and we back propagate collectively the loss that, that arises from all of them. And so we can learn the interatomic potential that makes water get into the structure of water. Uh, and this allows us to ask very intriguing questions about the about neural network potentials because there is, there is a theorem that states that the, there is only one of these uh, uh, radial distribution functions per potential. So in principle, this should be, you know, uh, bijective. This should be a one-to-one -one mapping between interaction potential and this uh, radial distribution function I was talking about. Uh, but it turns out it's, uh, it's, you know, again, to numerical precision is not quite right. And you can see how, um, let me find one of these examples. So here we train on different uh, uh, phase spaces and tested on different phase spaces. So I'll just pick one of these. So if you look at this guy, we're training at, uh, for a high density system. So Rho being the density of, of a Leonard Jones liquid uh, and, and uh, 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 training, at the, training at the high density, test at the high density. We nailed down the radial distribution function, right? So this trick allowed us to learn a good radial distribution function. But then if you look at the true potential that produced the data, this, this toy potential that we use in red and the set of, different local maxima or local optima that we found with our back propagation and, and uh, uh, differentiable simulators, it looks this is a very, uh, it's very sensitive, right? There is many interatomic potential choices, all of which result in the same experimental observable. Um, and this has sort of implications, maybe not so much for drug discovery, but, but definitely for, uh, uh, um, for, uh, for material simulations. And this is not dissimilar to, to learning sort of uh, 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 protein folding, right? Folks, folks, when they do this, they're learning the effective potential that makes the protein fold. Uh, where well, it turns out that's okay. If, if you only care about the local minima, all these potentials produce the same structure, but they will give you very different behavior. So that's, that's something that we continue to be uh, intrigued by. And then uh, in, in my last few minutes, I will talk about differentiable simulations for, for rare events. And, and the rare event I refer to is barrier crossing. Is this idea, so my, my problem statement here is I have a reactor and a product, right? I, my, my system can be defined as having initial and final states that I know of. Uh, and I want my simulator, my molecular dynamic simulator to find the path, the lowest free energy path or the lowest energy path that goes from one to the other. Um, so this is a classic example. This is called the Mueller-Brown potential, right? This is one uh, deep minima. This is the other deeper minima. And ideally, your best path, you know, if, if you're into mountaineering, you quickly think that, you know, that you want to come around this way, right? You don't want to take the full linear interpolation. You want to sort of follow this path, then go up the transition state, back into the other minima, back into the other. Um, this is a hard exploration task for molecular dynamics, right? Getting all the way up here is a very rare event. So you need to you know, spin, 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 and come here, spin, 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 and eventually get over the barrier in order to see directly. Uh, so what we set out is a, a differentiable simulator that fills the pool of the other basin. So at the end of the day, um, uh, we define sort of the, the, the success metric is here. Um, do I cross over? So I start here, I launch a trajectory, and I call it a success uh, if it crosses over, 
right? So that's, that's how I tally, that, that's my uh, um, uh, objective, right? What is the, the probability that a trajectory that starts in one basin eventually finds its way into the other basin? Um, and I reward, I learn the biasing, I learn an extra term in the energy that bias a, a, a trajectories nascent from one minima to try to get close to the other. Um, so what, what does this mean in practice? Well, it means that you know, we should add uh, um, trajectories at, at, the, at the beginning, and we have this very high loss, right? They're not, they're not crossing by, 0% have made it to the other side. And as we do iterations of, uh, of differentiable simulations, we continuously update extra driving force that makes, again, simulations that shoot from here, try to get as close as possible to the other minimum, right? And because we're augmenting, we're adding little increments of bias, uh, but we're still sampling according to, to molecular dynamics, according to the right ensemble, we still still to, to realistic basins, right? So we, we don't shoot up straight line um, trajectories because that would require accumulating a lot of energy, a lot of bias in this region. And at the end of the day, the, the, what we learn with, this, uh, with these paths is two things. First, we get sort of good paths that go from one side to the other, and you can see them mapped here, right? So these are points that have been visited once the, once the simulations are, are converged. Um, we can also learn what's so-called a collective variable, which is sort of a single variable, a single nonlinear combination of all the variables involved, which in this case is just X and Y, um, that tracks the progress of the reaction, right? So this is a collective variable that is learned purely from data and tracks uh, from zero to one through a continuous number, whether I'm in the, uh, or sorry, it doesn't, doesn't go from zero to one to tracks continuously from a minimum to a maximum, and whether I'm at the beginning, at the end, or somewhere in between, right? So that's, these are really useful. When you have these, uh, it, it opens a, a full set of simulation methods and, and, uh, uh, and it allow one to extract free energies for these barriers, um, but they're very hard to define a priori, right? What is, what is the hand, tune combination of, of X and Y that, that describes this motion. It's like, well, it's, it's the diagonal until you're here, and then it's maybe the other diagonal and maybe a little curve, right? So typically this, this require a lot of intuition and, and uh, through this approach, we can learn them end to end. And then what we plot here is what the original profile looked like along this coordinate, right? So again, if we were doing this by regular molecular dynamics, uh, starting from, from the left, we would have spin, 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 get over, spin, 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 eventually get over, right? And then the blue line is what the biasing potential has learned in order to maximize the crossing from left to right, right? In order to maximize this likelihood that a trajectory starting from here makes it all the way to the other end. Um, we've learned that we need to put energy along this path in this way, right? Puts a lot here, puts a, a bunch here, and it puts a lot on the product such that it biased potential in your surface is almost flat. And um, I want to make sure we, we get a little bit time for conversation. So I want to say this, the idea, you know, we, we it wasn't sort of necessarily um, very hard. It was, but it was also in practice pretty hard. We found for instance that uh, um, because molecular dynamic simulations are chaotic, uh, we can't really integrate for long periods of time. So we need, uh, we need to do a number of things. We need to do, like I said here, uh, we need to do Langevin dynamics to um, forget where the, where the simulation started from, right? So we have a, a noise term and a, and a viscosity term such that the model is not... Uh... Yes, uh, let, me, let me jump. Uh, so there's a question from Andre there. I'll, I'll talk in a second. Um, we found that unlike, unlike sort of traditional differentiable simulations for molecular dynamics, uh, instead of taking a single, the whole trajectory as, as a gradient update, we can take mini batches, randomized mini batches of sort of different subsets, maybe back to Hao Tsang's point, where it turns out we, we can take multiple ensembles at the same time, right? So you could you know, take all the even frames and take all the odd frames, and those make two mini batches that are sort of different and independent um, and give you different up gradient updates. So we get sort of the, the advantages of a stochastic gradient descent through a single mini batch. Um, and then this was very important and, and it's sort of very empirical, but we need to detach the gradients to essentially have the biasing potential, the amount of energy we shift up 
uh, the thing we learn is how, how much we shift up energy at a given point in a space such that the, the trajectory is diffused to the other side. Uh, it should depend only on the, on the position, uh, but it shouldn't depend on the on velocities, right? So we need to detach the dependence on the on the velocities. And then in terms of question, there is a, a question from Andre Politev uh, on the, uh, how would we perform on a, a free energy surface with multiple comparable transition states? That's a great question. We get them all, or you know, we aspire to get them all because we are not running a single trajectory. We can run an ensemble of trajectories that are, are initialized randomly. Uh, so they all explore phase space, you know, according to their initial conditions and, and uh, the shape of the potential energy surface. So if they're randomized at the beginning, they will reach different parts of phase space. They will all contribute to the bias. We learn the bias collectively from multiple trajectories. So in practice, we learn, we learn about 100 trajectories. So this is alanine dipeptide. And you can see in about 50 iterations, the loss goes down. And we start seeing lots and lots and lots of crossings. Um, and this is uh, to the right, this is the bias sampling uh, minus the log density of visiting states. So you can see how it learned to go, you know, from here to here across the diagonal, but also across the periodic boundary conditions on the corners. Um, so this is what a regular simulation would give you, right? The, the initial state, the final state, and this is what the bias simulation is giving us, right? So it's from this path that would go around here that was starting to explore by brute force. There's a path here. Uh, there is a, another path here that is less likely. And then there is this path here across uh, the periodic boundary conditions coming back to the other side. So what's the fundamental limit? We will need to see. I don't know how many equivalent or comparable transition state can there be that are sort of unrelated to one another, right? But if they are, in principle, something like this, we, we may be able uh, to see them. And then uh, I'll, I'll jump to Sanjeev in a question. This is a 5D Muller Brown potential. So it's like the potential I had before, but with three confounding Gaussians. So we have three more dimensions that are just Gaussians, broad Gaussians that just add uh, uh, a deeper local minima in, in, a, in a certain point of phase space. And again, you can see how the, at the beginning, uh, we, we don't get many crosses, we start crossing more. Like he, he, here, for some reason, it got stuck a little bit, and then we end up with 70% of trajectories being ballistic, right? So 70% of trajectories begin here and find their way to the other side in, in about a thousand updates in a very short trajectory. And if they don't, again, the gradient to the, from the basin, from the other basin, pulls them in geometrically to, to reward the trajectories that, that get there. Um, and then again, the learned collective variable, you can see this is now, this is actually a PCA because we have five dimensions now, we're sending them to two. Of course, the two that dominate are the uh, the two that, that are like the 2D Muller Brown, and the ones that, that are sort of spurious and just widen the space is the. Is it possible? Okay. So I'll, I'll maybe, since it's already written, saying how Wu is asking, is it possible to compute the free energy profile from the bias potential? Yes, 100% yes. So now we have everything. Now we have all the pieces. Now we have the, the biasing potential that we accumulated through the differentiable simulation. And we have a collective variable that describes the uh, geometry of the transition path. And my students tell me, well, Rafa, this biasing potential is not very good yet. And I would agree with them. If you can see, if your biasing potential was fully converged, you wouldn't have basins. This would be fully flat. This would be fully diffusive. Um, but now there's still local minima because you know we're giving them we're running MD, so we're saying, okay, if you start here and eventually make your way to the other side, you count as a win, you have 100% success, you have 0% loss. So we're not, we're not necessarily trying to flatten this further once, once the trajectories are crossing. But we now have a collective variable and we now have a good enough uh, biasing potential. So we could totally, uh, with this and this starting ground, do a little bit of metadynamics or a little bit of adaptive biasing force, gather sort of the last 10%, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of one uh, last mile away from having a good estimate of the free energy. So I, I would say uh, in theory, yes, we have everything that we need for the biasing for the free energy because we have the biasing potential and we have the collective variable. The, your, your free energy profile depends on your collective variable and uh, the, the log likelihood of the states visited is not the same as a free energy and, and uh, we've got a, couple of papers out uh, about the topic, but these plus the biasing potential gives you, gives you a free energy profile. Like I said, it's not fully converged yet. So we will need to do just enhanced sampling. 
without differentiable simulations to be to be sure that we've gotten good free energies. Um, Sanjeev, sorry, you've been with your hand up for a while. I hopefully the question yeah, is still relevant. Uh yeah, no problem. Yeah, my, my question was relating to the fact that you're using La Langevin dynamics uh, for this. So I understand that the reason I think that you did that is so that the adjoints sort of decay because you have a finite memory process. Um, so you can kind of uh, do some of the tricks that you did with the partial adjoints. But um, in, in many situations in MD simulations, uh, as far as I understand, Langevin dynamics uh, maybe cannot be used because they, they mess up the sort of autocorrelation and dynamical properties of the simulation. So how would you sort of extend this this type of approach to systems where there is a long, like a long memory in the system, it's not Markovian, um, and the properties that you're interested in maybe differentiating to match take a long time to conserve, or to, sorry, to, to converge, things like diffusivity, things like that. So where if you use Langevin dynamics, maybe it would mess up the, the, the autocorrelation properties. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. I think, um diffusivity well it depends i think if you can define the initial and the final state then free energy profiles will become rates so anything anything that can i can tie up to a free energy profile i can turn into a rate so in, in that sense kinetics is is definitely fine so we've, we've got a paper out it was about material so i took it out because it's not relevant to or i thought it wasn't relevant to, to this audience but we can totally take a, a track the, the um, positions of sorry the relative uh, positions of atoms um, throughout the throughout the uh, simulation and then with a collective variable get transformed likelihoods into into free energies and then the free energy barrier is is what determines the rates so we, we can cast trajectories to free energies to rates for phenomena that have a collective variable uh, but you are correct that, that things that are uh, correlation functions will be lost. Um, I don't think we can do deep sim for, for such long processes. We found it as sort of the, the, the gradients either, either disappear or, or explode uh, because of, of the chaotic nature of the, of the molecular dynamics simulators, I would say. But that doesn't prevent from calculating rates. We can calculate rates com with complete accuracy. Uh, as long as we have a, a free energy profile for them. So if, if you're uh, the property of interest that you have a, a correlation for can also be cast as a, as a kinetic barrier, then we, we can't take it on. Um, how Tsang was asking in the chat, how do we find, how do we confirm that we found all the transition states? There is no answer for that, right? Like that, that's sort of how do you know that you know what you don't know? There is, there is no way of knowing. And I would say you, you run more, right? You, you know, put more seeds, try more attempts. Uh, I would say it's, uh, we found that it's pretty, you know, if you add the bias in more slowly, then you're exploring more, right? If, if you let the, if, if the learning rate is, is low, then it will look more like molecular dynamics and less like forced uh, to, to get to the other basins. So probably we'll have more time to bump into other transition states. So at, at this point, it's, it's always going to be empirical about sort of how are you, how certain are you that you found all the, all the transition states, but also you only need to find the low ones, right? Finding, finding high subtle points that are sort of far away don't, doesn't really matter. So. Um, I would say finding the wall is, is not as important as finding all the low energy ones that, that mean something. Uh, what about the hybrid model with quantum mechanics and deep learning in the field from, uh, from Sami Banji and um, Bahik, sorry. Um, yeah, we like them. I feel like uh, deep learning applied to electronic structure is hard. And, and you know, this mean people have so like the nitrogen molecule with, with uh, uh, quantum Monte Carlo. But the scaling of, of these things, even when accelerated by deep learning, is, is hard. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a curious observer, but I, I don't have any intelligent thoughts that, that hop over the, the terrible scaling of, of anything that, that tries to solve the, the Schrodinger equation uh, and fermionic problems uh, with machine learning. Um, maybe uh, Prudencio, I think uh, Sanjeev still has his hand up. Yeah. So. I was just wondering, in general, it, the familiar method we have discussed now, like what's the, the limit, what's prevent people from applying them to protein at the moment? Is it scalability, like, and how do we get there, like? Yeah, I think we're, we're, we're on it. I think it's, uh, you know, we've, we've put them out in, in theory. They work for, uh, for toy problems. They work sort of for material science problems that are a hundred atoms. Um, 
one of the key questions is that you need the initial and the final state, right? In order for, for, the, for the product basin to pull the, the reactant trajectories, one needs to have a well-defined product and a well-defined uh, reactant state, uh, which is not always the case, right? Oftentimes, especially around protein folding and protein dynamics, one really doesn't know what the other is, you know, like, okay, I know what the, my, my frozen, you know, my alpha fold or my crystal structure looks like, but I don't know what this other structure looks like, right? So in, in that sense, this is more about, uh, about uh, barrier finding than it is about sort of uh, uh, rare events of any kind. So I would say, um, and then what else do you need? You need an auto-differentiable uh, molecular dynamic simulator, but there is two, right? There is JAXMD and there is TorchMD, both of which have, you know, are in principle compatible with, uh, with differentiable simulations. So it, it's more about sort of, you know, taking on the challenge of, of making this work and about defining a, an interesting protein problem that has an initial and a final state that are, that are well-defined so you can measure success for the crossing. And do you see this method being applied? So for example, like, so in binding, in protein again binding, I think that's maybe one part where we do have the, the initial and, and, and final set, right? Do you see this being applied in, in, in such uh, cases? Yeah, this is a, I, I don't know if anybody from, from Relay is in the call, um, but uh, Relay has a, a something called a time machine where they sort of played around with, with differential simulations for free energy calculations. So I think it, it would be, we would need to see how they compare with sort of well fine tuned free energy uh, uh, perturbation schemes, uh, it's absolute and relative. But yeah, it's, uh, you know, one could start from the docking post maybe as the product, right? So you always have a way to guess what the product looks like uh, and, and from there pull things out of the protein. Yeah, that's a good, you know, uh, we're in material science. So we're always sort of a little bit wary of, of, you know, we need to have very well-defined problems before we, we jump. Um, but yeah, I think it, it should be applicable to binding events or you could think about sort of protein-protein recognition, right? Going from two isolated proteins where the free energy barrier is for them to become the complex. And I think that would be, you may even have a crystallographic data point for the complex and a crystallographic point for the two individual proteins. And then you want to explore sort of how, what the free energy barrier is for them meeting. So I think that there are large scale interesting applications uh, for this. Um, there's a question there from Alex Mathiasen whether Jackson D and Torch and D use the, the hardware accelerators. Yes, big time. Um, I'm not sure how effective they are. I know we, we struggled a little bit with TorchMD and, and uh, uh, some of the some code optimization and the um, uh, and sort of the disconnecting the the gradient. So it, it wasn't completely straightforward to to apply this technique to to TorchMD. And again, we're, we're a Torch crowd, so not sure about Jacks, but I'm sure they use they use hardware accelerators. Um, Sorry, I missed, uh, maybe I missed Joshua's question. Or maybe, ah, oh. ah, yeah. So sorry, the first question uh, right there from the beginning was uh, Joshua, maybe his, his clock is set to another time because it says 10 and, and we weren't here at 10 yet. Um, yeah, the, it less to flatter or the right path only. Yeah, so the, the biasing potential accumulates on the frames that are visited, right? So essentially the biasing potential uh, is a function of, of, this, of the points that are visited. Um, and the points that are visited are visited based on the, initially on the unbiased potential and the little bit of bias that is accrued all the time. So in principle, right, we're, we're sort of uh, within our best guess of what the path is, right? At the beginning we're sampling according to the naive potential. We add bias based on the points we've visited so far. Um, and the points that we visited so far follow statistical mechanics, or we're drawing from the from the uh, from the Boltzmann distribution, meaning they're the high likelihood states. So we kind of we stay all, all these sort of enhanced sampling techniques tend to accrue potential. The biasing potential gets accrued on frames that were high likelihood before, and they're pushed. You know, you accrue potential, so you push away from them. So you can think of this as sort of uh, feeling feeling uh, computational sand that fills up the basin based of, of what the points have, uh, have been visited so far. So in that sense, the, we only add bias in regions we've visited, and we visited regions that were high likelihood. So that's how we, we ensure that we're in high likelihood regions uh, over time. And then there is another question from Sanjeev. Um, 
is the is the bias potential regularized to ensure that we don't do a physical path transition? That's a good question. We haven't bumped into that yet. Um, in the infinite limit, we would end up flattening. Uh, we would end up in a potential that is a complete straight line, right, and, and flatten all the landscape. In theory, we, we haven't reached that limit by a far stretch. You can see we haven't even completely flattened our path. We always we, we still have some uh, a little bit of uh, in our 5D potential, right? We cross we cross 100% of the time in, in a thousand steps, but we still haven't completely flattened our profile. So I don't we, we don't need to worry about sort of flattening all of phase space, but it could eventually happen. In, happen, yeah. We we haven't sort of put in guardrails uh, to protect from that, but you could think about some um, sort of temperature that switches over from this aggressive path seeking uh, to just enhance sampling, right? At some point you say, well, you know what? I like my collective variable. I'm going to stop trying to learn the collective variable. I already know it. And now I'm going to move to pure enhanced sampling, right? So I, I will just learn the bias, but across this, I, I already trust my CV. So I, I think that's, that's a switch that we haven't explored yet, but we definitely should.